Welcome to Eleutheria Community's Church's weekly teaching. Today we are going to be talking about love, family, and love is a very important thing to understand because the Bible tells us so. When we look to Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says from verse 7, well, I'll read from verse 16. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, one thing I'm sure we all want is to be filled with the fullness of God. And Paul highlights to us the importance in the way of knowing and starting to understand is by starting to understand love. And it's through understanding the love of Christ that we can start to understand the fullness of God. And it's then through love of each other that we can start to demonstrate our love in action and that Ellie don't, don't play with it from Baba and that is a key thing for us to understand and one thing we should always think about is how long do we spend meditating and reflecting on God's love because God's love is different than the world's version of love it's very very different God's love is based around something much more than we can comprehend. It's based around sacrifice. The world's love is based around giving. The world's love is based around spoiling. The truth of God's love is based around sacrifice. So when we meditate on God's love, how do we see God's love? We see God's love laid out for us on the cross. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that is God's love sacrifice redemption god's love is restoration without requesting and that's something pretty crazy when you stop and think about it that the love god has for us is that he provided the payment for our sin before we even asked for it that punishment already happened onto a body for the lives that we all chose to live before we accepted him in faith. And that is a very, very beautiful love. It's a very special love. And it's a love with which changes us. It's a love with which brings transformation. It's a love with which starts to bring fruit and action in our lives that starts to show that we are of the world, but not of the world that starts to show we live on this planet, but we don't live for this planet. That we have a faith and a belief in something much more, which therefore means the world and the ways of the world has no authority or grasp on our lives. Because we've started to understand God's love. And not only have we started to understand it, but we've started to show God's love to the people around us. Because our ability to show God's love is going to be linked to the ability with which we know God loves us. And that's why Paul tells us it's so important for us to try and fathom the depths, widths and heights of God's love for us through Christ. Because it is only through that we can have the fullness of God, which is the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, with which we then have the ability 
to be a light in this darkness because God himself fills us, rules and reigns in us and lives in us to show the truth of his love to the world around us. So always a good thing to do is to spend time every day reflecting on how much God loves you. And then you can then contextualize it. Yes, Ellie. You can then context. I can't sit there now. Papa's preaching. After we can sit there. And it's to contextualize that love. It's almost thinking about someone knew you were going to go into a crazy amount of credit card debt. And you went and you spent it all, got into millions of dirhams worth of debt. And then when it comes time to payment and you've realized what you've done, you find out this one man sold everything he had to pay off your debt before you even knew you was going to rack it up. And you go, that's quite insane. Who is this one man? And that one man is Jesus. Because that's what he fundamentally did. That's what God fundamentally did is that he sacrificed everything that was a joy to him and sacrificed him for your sins. And that's a level of love we cannot even comprehend. And the Proverbs show us that the spirit of wisdom that is the spirit of Christ was in joyous union with the Father before, you, before the world was created. Jesus tells us before Abraham he was that we know he was eternal with the Father before coming onto earth as man. And we know the Father delights in him. That's what the word says. When Jesus was baptized, he said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And he willingly let his son be punished for us. And you think how much it grieves our hearts to see our own children in pain. Can you imagine how much it grieved the perfect father, the perfect God, to see his perfect son punished in the way he was punished for our sins. So you spend every day reflecting on the love Christ has for us. Because when you understand God loves you that much, you can't help but change. You can't help but weep. Your heart can't help but change. Because when you know you're loved that much, how can you not start to love your brethren? Mm. And what does then that love look like in action? Because this is really important to then understand. We can know the theory, but we must know the action. So when we go back, let's turn back to Ephesians. And, you know, we find out so much that marriage and family is so much about representing God to the world around us. It's why the marriage covenant is so sacred. Because the marriage between husband and wife, within the context of Christianity showcases to the world the relationship between Christ and his bride or Christ and his church. So therefore, we as a husband and wife and daughter must start to represent the church, Christ and God to the world around us. So we've got a bit of long reading in Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the saviour of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Now what does this mean? What does this look like? This looks like true submission. Now, when we look to the book of Acts and we see how the apostles were beaten unrightfully tortured and put in prison and even killed they all did it with joy as to submission to the lord they didn't complain they didn't question they submitted with joy to the unjustness that was happening to them in faith that their lord knew better so what does that look like wives wives that looks like when your husband says something, whether rightfully or unrightfully, you submit in faith that he knows better. 
in faith that he hears from Christ, in faith that he is the head that the Lord has placed over you. In the same way that Paul tells us to submit under the authorities, because they are the authorities that God has placed above us, wives are to submit under the authorities placed above them. Why? Because through the wife's submission, wives, hi Papa, wives are starting to show the submission of the church to Christ, irrespective of good or bad. So wives, you must submit because your submission shows to the world around you how we as the church submit to Christ's will, irrespective of good or bad. It's very easy to submit and follow when prosperity is the key. However, can we submit when we feel like we are being wronged? And that is a very hard thing, if not impossible thing for the flesh to do. Submission only comes through the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see, that when the apostles or the disciples and Jesus was being persecuted, they all ran away. They did not want to join in his suffering. Even Peter went and denied Christ because he did not want to partake in the suffering. They were all willing to give it big talk. Yes, we will, we will, we will suffer with you. But when push came to shove, they ran. And that's what the flesh does. The flesh likes to give it all of this. But when push comes to shove and it's time to put fruit and action where words are, it runs away. So that's why submission is important. Because once people had the Holy Spirit, the disciples then became apostles and they were able to submit under suffering with joy. And that's why, wives, you must submit to your husbands because it's an opportunity to show potential unjust suffering with joy because of your relationship in the Lord. And Christian husbands, this doesn't now mean you get to boss around your wives. Because there's now something for you next. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. To make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. And then for men, this is so important. Your role is not to boss around. Your role is to make the authoritative decisions that you are then accountable for as the leader, Wives, you submit to that authoritative decision with joy because your role is to then be accountable for your submission. You will not account for the decision. You will account for your submission. And husbands, your role is not just to decide and lead. You're meant to lead as per the word. Teach your family the word of God. Teach your family the ways of God by being the example of Christ. And the way we men are the example of Christ is to die for our wives. It's to lay down our lives so they may Become holy. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. For us as husbands, in the same way husbands are to love their wives. We see several fold things here. Paul talks about in other letters about a husband's relationship with his wife to treat her as one of lesser faith. Now this is not to say that wives have less faith, but to treat her as one as lesser faith. What does that mean? Because this is a really important thing for men to understand. It's to understand your role is to treat her as someone you're trying to clean. By choosing to take her place. By choosing to clean up her sin before she knows it's even a sin. By choosing to play intercession before things go wrong. And it's your choice to lay down and suffer for her. In certain cases, it's an example of choosing to suffer by doing the dishes or choosing to suffer by cleaning the kitchen even though you've been at work because you know if your wife comes down and sees a messy kitchen she's going to get upset and beef 
which is going to cause her to stumble. So your choice is to lay down your rights so she doesn't stumble in things that she may stumble in. And that's really important for men to understand. That it's not your job as the husband to boss around. It's your job as the husband to make accountable decisions, to lead your family in the word, and then most importantly to put your flesh to death so they may be holy. It's so you wake up early to pray and intercede so she may get an extra hour's sleep. It's so you choose to get up and deal with the children so she can sleep. Why? Because you press into the Lord to sustain you. And you don't want her to be tired and grumpy and where she may then stumble. So you're choosing to put yourself in the position of suffering so you can press into the Lord and lay down your rights so she may be in a stronger position to be holy, spotless and blameless before the Lord as you present her as your bride to him. And this is a very important thing to understand because if women will submit to men biblically, to their husbands, as we will biblically submit to Christ, whether suffering or prosperity, and then husbands choose to lay down their lives to prevent their wives from sinning, you will see a very different world around you in very different marriages. And then children, you're not left out of this beef as well. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. What was that? Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. See, husbands, it ain't for your wife to do the Bible study and to take the kids to church. It's not for the wives to take the kids to children's ministry. Husbands, it's your role to teach your children. You must teach your children the ways of Adonai. Wives, if your husbands are not believers and are not active Christians, then of course you must step up. But for husbands, those of you who are choosing to chase the Lord, it's your role to work with your children, to make sure they are taught how to worship, how to kneel, how to pray, how to love. Don't stir up anger in your children. Don't purposely annoy them. I know, guys, it can be really tempting to annoy people. I know it's one of my biggest gripes. I like to annoy my wife. But don't do it to your children. It doesn't say don't annoy your wives, so we're safe there. But do not obey, stir up anger in your children. Don't purposely make your children angry. It's your role. In the same way God does not purposely make us angry, we do not purposely make our children angry. Children, Ellie, obey mother and father. It's simple. Now let's go back to the word again. And let's look for further clarification to understand how Christ's love will help us in understanding further what this all means. So let's turn back to Romans chapter 14. Therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. I know I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Still to someone who considers a thing to unclean, so to that one it is unclean. For if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy by what you eat someone for whom Christ died. So, if you hurt a brother or sister by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. Now when we expand on that, what does that mean? It means you've made a choice to do something that's going to make someone else stumble. And that is not walking in love. So when we behave as Christians to other Christians, is the way we're behaving potentially going to cause offense and cause them to stumble? If so, you're not walking in love. You know, one common example in today's world amongst Gen Z is, is people just love not to reply. That's rude. And that can cause people to stumble. That's not walking in genuine love. And it's not also walking in respect. Or in the case of where Paul's talking about the way we choose to eat amongst other Christians may cause people to stumble. And therefore, that is not walking in love. And that's an understanding what the self-sacrificial love of God will do to us. That we understand how he sacrificed for us. Therefore, we will sacrifice our rights to eat whatever we want 
in order to eat a certain way to not offend our brother and sister in Christ. And that is then the love of God manifest. So when it goes from food to drink to behavior to communication to the way we dress to everything we do, if we start living in this self-sacrificial love where our focus is to try and make people not stumble, guess what happens? The world changes. Oh, Baba. The world changes. And we start to see God's love walked out amongst us. We start to see the fullness of God manifest in our lives. Because first we've started to understand God's love is a self-sacrificial love. God's love is not just, I'm going to give you all the teddy bears. It's not, I'm just going to give you a nice job and a big paycheck and a nice house. It's not, I'm going to give you a ministry with anointing. God's love is, I died for your sins. End of discussion. When we understand that, and it's changed our heart, we can start loving people in the same way. That we don't begrudge them, we don't judge them. We choose to do what we can to clean up their sin so they may be presentable, holy, and blameless before God. And that's why it first must start in the family home. Yeah, Papa. You want to come on Papa's lap? Come on then. You can come sit on Papa's lap before we close. Before we close. Come. You can come to Papa's lap, then we'll close. Come on. Come to Papa. Uh, nice stepping over Pablo. Come, Bubba. You can close with Papa. Ah. And that's why Paul in 1 Timothy puts a very important mandate for pastors about families. There must be husbands of one wife with children, etc., etc. Because the truth of the knowledge of God's love in our life will demonstrate the fullness of God in us will first and foremost be shown in our family. You can go back to Mama now. Yeah? Mama. Okay, go back to Mama. We'll be shown first and foremost in our families. Husbands, your relationship with your wife demonstrates the relationship of Christ with his church. Wives, your relationship to your husband demonstrates the submission of the church to Christ's leadership. Children, your obedience to your parents demonstrates the obedience we have to God. Parents to children demonstrates the way the Father chastises and disciplines you as an individual. So you are all presented holy, spotless, and blameless before the Lord as you all start choosing to self-sacrifice to ensure the other person does not stumble. And that is how we get the fullness of God in our lives. Crying, baby. Oh, Baba. Ah.